building a better Bay Area for a safe and secure future. This is ABC 7 News. Hi there, I'm Kristen Z. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to our daily program called Getting Answers. This week, we are focusing on education as the school year is about to begin, and we're going to start with the youngest. This morning, President Trump sent a tweet saying, open the schools, but what about preschools and child care facilities? So today, we are going to explore that issue. And joining me now is Marcy Whitebrook, Director Emerita at the Centers for the Study of Child Care Employment, which is based at UC Berkeley. Marcy, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for asking me to join you. So I want to ask you, where are we now with daycare centers and um, child care? Because uh, they have been running first just for essential workers, right? They were closed for a while and then just for essential workers and then in June for uh, everyone. But I know not every center, public or private, is open. Kind of give us a quick snapshot in the percentages. Sure. So um, I just want to say one thing, which is that California never officially closed its child care centers. There were 15 states that did close them only for emergency workers. California did not do that, although it prioritized services for essential workers. So there was sort of a flashing yellow light on child care um, that was operating from before June. But uh, the we just did a study at, uh, that was in the field um, the second half of June into, I think, July 2nd uh, with about 1,000 programs in the state. And we found that 82% of the family child care programs were open in, in our sample and about 65% of the centers were open. Mm -hmm. And that ma maps on pretty well to the data in the state about how many um, you know, the, the good portion of the programs are open now. Okay, so given that um, they are open, what kind of data have we been able to gather? Because early on we heard COVID transmissions were not really happening in significant numbers at all as a result of daycares and preschools, that those settings were safer, that children are not really vectors uh, for COVID. But what are you finding now? Right. Well, what, what the Department of Social Services has been publishing data for since the 14th of July. And at that point, there were about 1,054 1, cases uh, that had positive cases that had been reported uh, in family, licensed family child care licensed um, centers across the whole state. Uh, and now this is three weeks, well, about almost three weeks later, I, the last date I have up here in front of me, we're at about 1,500 cases. So in the last two plus week, we've seen, you know, the cases grow by about 30%. But what I want to say about that that's important for your listeners is that um, th this just tells you in, you know, across the whole state, how many positives have been reported. And so it doesn't provide information for you about whether or not there's, there are a cluster of um, uh, program or, you know, there's a cluster within a particular program. We just know that, and it would make sense, is that as the, their cases are going up in the state, you're seeing a rise in cases in uh, open, child care facilities. Sure. The majority of the cases are um, the adults are being affected. The, the number of child cases in both family child care and in center-based cases is low. Um, you know, a little over 100 in both cases. Right. Well, um, for parents considering all this, right, all this data and trying to decide whether they should send their kids to uh, daycare, either, you know, at a home or a public facility, um, you know, should they feel safe? I mean, overall, would you say, look, that carries no more danger than anything else? I think people look at what's been happening. Like last week, there was that Georgia YMCA summer camp where you had 260 test positive, 168 of them kids. And we're talking about young kids. Um, what does that say? I mean, what is your suggestion to parents? Is it safe to send their kids to daycare? Well, I think we have to sort of step back and go, you know, under what circumstances is it safe? And I think what's interesting in California is we're setting very different criteria for younger children in childcare than we have in schools. You know, the the governor had said, kind of gave counties a green light to open schools, and then he said, no, we're we're not going to until we ha make sure we can test the teachers, we have PPP in place, 
PPE in place and um, we can make sure that the facilities are well ventilated. None of those same mm -hmm. criteria have been applied to childcare. Now I know from our research with a lot of programs, they're doing everything they possibly can to make to follow public health guidelines and to keep the program safe. Mm. And so I think you know, like what we don't know for sure, and the the information and the science is about children's risks is evolving. So mm -hmm. I think um, you know, I think people want to know. Oh, it's just fine, and and we can't necessarily. I don't think anyone can assure them. It doesn't seem at the moment that childcare is. It's, they're not like you know. They're not. You're not seeing clusters of a lot of cases, but also most of the facilities at this point are operating with you know fewer children than normal. So um, Zuzu Petals has a question. Um, you mentioned fewer children. So uh, I want to relate her question to you if you know the answer. What is being done to financially support private preschools? Uh, we are required to have fewer kids and more staff, which results in a reduction in revenue and an increase in expense. Very true. Right. Well, we, and yes, I, to your listener, you, that's exactly right. And I, you're not getting enough help. We know that uh, most of the programs that we, people we spoke to said that they had um, had some loss of income from families. 99% of the centers said that they were operating with fewer children and 78% of the family child care homes said that and close to about half of what they had before. Mm -hmm. And as I know your listener knows, under the best of circumstances, fully enrolled, it's almost impossible to keep child care programs open and, you know, generate enough income to cover costs. So I think that this is, is really escalating the crisis um, because programs are, have fewer kids, they're getting less resources, and they have more expenses in terms of changes they have to make to their facilities and buying cleaning materials. And we've heard from people that, you know, people are foregoing their earnings for a month and family child care. People have talked about not being able to pay their mortgage or using credit cards. So it is a crisis and the government um, has done some, but not anywhere near at the level of need. There's a bill pending in uh, Congress right now mm -hmm. for a $50 billion bailout uh, or you know, relief bill. I don't know what they call it, a bailout yeah. uh, for uh, child care programs uh, for private, you know, and it would include private as well as um, public programs. But, you know, it's we don't we have we don't know if that's going to pass. Marcy, I sent some support for that uh, bill and for the additional funding from the federal government. Uh, I appreciate your time. That's all the time we have for now. But let's keep this conversation going. I do appreciate it. Now we're going to okay, take a short thank you break. All. Thank you. When we uh, come back on air, we're going to have a Bay Area principal talking to us about what they're doing as school approaches for San Francisco, plus a conversation about toddlers and preschoolers with the nonprofit First Five California. Be right back. All right. Thanks for joining us. Uh, folks, you probably noticed I was off for a week, just getting my first uh, full week break, I guess, since February, um, if you can believe that. So it was nice just to take the time and um, be with family and uh, do a short trip. And I'm back, refreshed and ready to tackle education in terms of our uh, focus this week at ABC7 as schools get ready to start. Uh, maybe your kid's school and you're wondering What's it going to look like for them? And if it doesn't look the way you had hoped it would look, what can you do to supplement or create an environment in which he or she can still thrive, um, both academically and socially? We'll be exploring those issues. And we're setting up our next guest right now. We are going to talk about how to support the youngest, youngest uh, set of kids. We're talking about zero to five. So um, that will be an interesting conversation. Submit your questions now if you have um, anything at all for education administrator for First Five, which is an organization uh, that is a nonprofit that supports the families of zero to five year olds. Um, hey, here's a good question. I'll try to get that in about mental health. Hey, somebody trying to talk to me?
All right. Thanks for sticking with us through a commercial break. Isn't it exciting that General Hospital is back with new episodes? So today was the first day, and um, and I know we've all been waiting for that. So, all right. Let's get ready to come back on air. Aaron Doobie, are you with us? Excellent. We are back and we want to continue exploring education for toddlers and preschoolers. First Five is a nonprofit child advocacy organization. Its focus is to educate parents and caregivers about the important role they play in their children's first five years. Please welcome Erin Duby. She is education administrator for First Five uh, operating here in California. Erin, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you today? Uh, I'm doing just fine. I want to say first five, of course, is uh, throughout California counties. We have some great centers here in the Bay Area. And for all of them, I know, as you said, education standards. What do you tell parents right now with kids who are ages zero to five? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are in really uncertain, unprecedented times. And I think first and foremost, it's really important to support children's social emotional needs. Uh, the world around them right now feels a little scary and confusing. They may be missing friends um, and family, and they've probably gotten out of some of the structure and routine that they were used to before COVID. So um, it's just really important to support their emotional needs, show them love, care, a lot of patience, um, and just know that they may be a little bit more clingy during this time, and that's to be expected. But offering a lot of hugs and kisses throughout the day can really help, and even just sitting down and reading books together. It's mm -hmm. a great way to bring a little calm and peace to your day, bond with your child um, or children in your care if you are a child care provider, and um, build their brains all at the same time. All right. Well, you started to get into that, but I want to explore a little bit more from the parents' perspective, right? Uh, I remember when my kids were young, I took them to Mommy and Me Baby Swim or dance classes. Um, now, of course, you cannot do that. Uh, I took them to Library Story Time. Of course, you cannot do that now. Give us some great substitutes for, you know, those activities and enriches them in that same way. Absolutely. So, um, I think that one of the things that parents can do is sort of look at what they have around the house and think about doing things like rotating toys. So um, putting some things away and bringing out things on a daily basis. It might just be a couple of things a day, maybe Legos and a ball to play outside. Um, because when a familiar toy um, goes away and then comes out, it feels a little bit new. So um, that can really help. And then if you don't have a lot of toys and books around the house, that's okay too. You can do things like sort laundry together. You can have um, children help to make meals. Um, and you can think about just doing some time singing songs, storytelling, um, or doing something like building a fort, which also provides a kind of a quiet um, alone spot if your kiddo just wants a little quiet time. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of different things you can do. And actually, we have some great tips on our website, uh, first5california.com. Um, for parents to go, they can even download books there. So mm -hmm. that's a really helpful resource. I saw that resource, which is what brought us to calling you up and saying, can you share them with us on air here? Um, I think I saw something relating to a virtual Zoom experience for like two-year-olds, where I think the suggestion was you can have like a little train, toy train, and then on the other end, you could have another two-year-old friend who has a toy train, and then you guys can create scenarios together. That is not something I would have thought of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kids these days are pretty used to technology and they're pretty savvy with it. And um, it's a great way to help them connect with a friend or connect with a family member um, that they may not be seeing like a grandparent. Um, and so they, they can engage in those kinds of virtual opportunities to have sort of those virtual play dates, um, read books together, play together. Um, you know, I know my children are a little bit older, but they've done that with their friends as well. And it's just gives them a little bit of normalcy and a little bit of variety in their day that helps from keep them being um, bored. So but there is just, a great idea. in the end, though, it's really hard to replicate that playground experience, right? Where you just pick Absolutely. up another kid's shovel uh, and, you know, is there anything that we can kind of try to do to replicate that in a safe way? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, um, for parents who are working, they can um, have their children in a childcare experience right now. It is really challenging for our providers who are doing so much right now, um, but there are, are opportunities for sort of social distancing. Um, but I think the other thing is sort of doing, you know, the online story times or um, 
just getting out mm -hmm. in your yard. Um, you know, playgrounds aren't necessarily um, considered the safest place right now just because of um, potential germs, but definitely mm. getting outside with your kids. It's really important to think about different types of activities that build different skills. So getting outside or doing even a, um, a you know, a, a dance session inside with your child just to get their gross motor, motor skills um, progressing. And then you can, you know, alternate that with something that mm -hmm. is more focused on thinking skills or fine motor skills, um, even just handing them a pencil and some paper mm -hmm. and just being able to sit down and, um, and practice writing or do some pretend play. All of those are really great things for parents to do with kids throughout for, the day. For parents who are looking for the right childcare option for their kids, do you think at this point it is safer to look at, let's say, a smaller in-home daycare versus a larger facility with lots of kids just because of the numbers? Yeah, there are a few different options. Um, family child care homes generally have smaller groups of children, um, but centers are also operating right now and they are required to have smaller numbers of children and to have consistent groups of children. So um, I think if you're a parent who's in need of care, you could go either way. And then I think the other option is family, friend and neighbor care. Um, and we do have um, an initiative in California called Quality Counts, and we have a great website that's qualityca.net, and that has a lot of information for parents about choosing care and what types of care are available, as well as information for providers who might be seeking some resources. And now is a great time if providers aren't working to really get in and get some training done, do some online distance learning, connect with um, others in the field, and um, so those options are there as well. All right, Erin Duby from First uh, Five, you've certainly given us some great ideas today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Take care. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have a San Francisco principal talking to us about what their fall semester is going to look like for their youngest students, their kindergartners. We'll be right back. All right, folks, uh, today we have a, you know, one for the price of three. No, actually, it's three for the price of one. Otherwise, I'd be overcharging you. Um, we have three great guests today. Hope you learned a lot from Erin. I sure did. Um, uh, next guest is, in fact, not only a principal, but she's also an author. And her book uh, has a lot of great ideas as well in terms of parent-student communications and parent-teacher communications. So um, we'll talk about that. And also talk about um, you know, how school might look and is it going to be different from the spring? Is distance learning the same now as it was or is it going to be vastly different? So send your questions, especially if you have little ones, because that's what we're focusing on today. Tomorrow we'll be looking at the slightly older kids in elementary school. And then Wednesday, we'll have the middle and high schoolers. And then Thursday, we'll look at the needs and operations of universities and colleges. And then Friday, I think we end with um, parents and teachers. So uh, good stuff, educational stuff coming our way this whole week. Um, I'm glad I had a week to decompress before getting back into it. Uh, hey there. Our next guest is Meredith. Uh, Meredith, pronounce your last name for me, please. Esselat. Esselot? Yes, exactly. Yay, okay, great. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, is your school uh, K through eight? It is, yes, okay. right here in the city. Fabulous, and what's your first day? Uh, August 26th. All right, so this is the last minute crunch, right? It is, it has been just a race to the finish line, that's for sure. All right, we're getting ready to come back on air in five seconds. And we're back. Governor Newsom said schools cannot operate in person at this point until they are off the state's monitoring list for 14 straight days. Now, San Francisco County is uh, on that list. So with that being said, let's bring on our next guest to talk about education, focusing on younger students. We have the principal at Mission Dolores Academy and author of the book, The Overly Honest Teacher, due out on October 13th. Meredith Esselot, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to add to what I said about uh, schools they can't do in person unless they're off the watch list. I think elementary schools can apply for that waiver. 
and if the county grants that waiver, they can do in person. Having said that, Meredith, I know your school is starting with distance learning and you had tried all summer to plan for kind of a hybrid model. Uh, so it's, you know, you're adjusting as you go. But I want to start by asking you this, because I think when we say distance learning, a lot of parents get all sorts of negative vibes because they remember what happened in the spring. So is distance learning this fall going to be the same or very different from distance learning that we saw this past spring? You know, I think it's going to be an evolution. I think that the spring was a great time for us to warm up, to start to figure out what worked and what didn't, and really begin to refine our plans, our schedules, our approaches with the diversity of learners that we all have in our academic communities. And I think that it gave us the chance to really weed out the things that were unsuccessful so that we could know exactly how we wanted to start back this fall. Okay, so what are the things that were unsuccessful that you're not gonna do anymore? And what are the key things you are going to start doing? You know, I think that things that we really wanna tap into is making sure that we are offering um, a really individualized platform for each of our students. So making sure that we are having Zoom meetings for the whole class together for that sense of community and to present different concepts, to make sure that we're using small group instruction to really target the individual needs of learners in our classrooms. And then also to give students time for one-on-one -on -one meetings with us or to work independently on blended learning platforms that are adaptive to their needs. Um, I think that all of those things together are gonna create a really successful plan as we move to remote learning yet again. Right, yet again. Uh, you do talk about maintaining routines and traditions. Can you give us some examples of what that means and how you'll implement that? Absolutely. You know, in the spring, we there's so many fun things that come at the end of the school year. So we had the chance to run our talent show via YouTube, to do our graduation ceremony via Zoom and streaming it online. Mm -hmm. But into the fall, you know, one of the hallmarks of our school community in particular is our school creed that we normally would say every morning together, kindergarten through eighth graders at morning assembly. And so we're going to stream that online so that students can start their day with that really as a punctuation of this is where my learning begins. Um, and then moving into the fall, you know, we're going to have a virtual tiger trot and a digital scholastic book fair. We want to make sure that our students feel connected to those traditions and activities that make learning exciting for them and make coming back to school so special. Um, how would you keep track of whether the kids actually join? Because, you know, when you're in person and those activities are happening around you, you're just naturally a part of it. This, you have to overcome the hurdle of getting them to actually log in. And then you know how kids can do things on Zoom where they look like they're there, but they're not actually there. What can you do there, Meredith? Yeah, no, um, I think it's really important, one, to just from the very beginning to set expectations with our students. So your camera is going to be on. I had... Uh, teachers in my middle school uh, use Nearpod, which is a platform that can be used in a lot of different grade levels. But what it does is it asks real-time questions throughout the course of a lesson or a lecture, and students have to read and respond to those questions in real time based on what the teacher has been discussing. Mm -hmm. And it's a great way for us to keep a pulse on our students who are really listening to us and not necessarily watching YouTube on another tab on their computer. Um, beyond that, our teachers really do. We take attendance at the beginning and end of each class to make sure that our students, even if they've gone into breakout rooms, mm -hmm. they're still with us, still on task. But how long do you think kids in kindergarten, right, um, maybe ages five and six, how long can they really stay focused that way virtually? You know, um, we are looking at a schedule which is in very short blocks of time throughout the course of the day. And I think during the summertime, it's a great chance for parents to start to exercise those focused muscles with their students, mm -hmm. um, giving them short duration Zoom calls, maybe with a grandparent or a friend or two, and start in shorter increments, five to 10 minutes, and then build up. And the same thing can go with online applications and programs. Um, if a student could log into Khan Academy for kids, for example, and you start to build up incremental time for them to work on it to where ideally you would get to about 15 to 20 minutes at a time. Ah, it's like cardiovascular fitness. You got to build it up, right? Okay, yes. so what are the keys for success for a kindergarten? Like, what do you need to provide as a school and teachers? And what do the parents need to provide? 
you know, more than anything else, and this is universal, but specifically for younger students, they need to understand the idea that they're in school. For our kindergartners, that's a very new concept. It's different than preschool, different than a pre-K program. So in the home environment, setting up a, a workspace for them, getting them excited about this is your desk. You know, we still can capitalize on that whimsy and enthusiasm that our youngest students have. And um, making sure that you present their work around that corner in, in your home, make it their, their classroom environment and show work that they're proud of, highlight work that you're really proud of that they've accomplished, um, build into the schedule time for brain breaks. We do it at school all the time. Go Noodle is a really great a website online where they can get up and take a body break and get the wiggles out. And I think the more that parents can do a little bit of practice now, between now and when school starts, it's going to make the onset of school much easier. And setting a parent schedule and, and work from home as close to what their students schedule is going to be at least in anticipating when they're going to be online with their teacher and when they're going to be working on their own is going to really help parents as well feel less stressed and hairy. All right um, I want to touch on the emotional health of the students and how you as a parent can really monitor uh, the emotional health and social health of your very youngest kids, the ones who are, you know, kindergarten or younger. And that leads me to your book, uh, which I see behind you on the shelf there, The Overly Honest uh, Teacher. Uh, and I know that is kind of what the book is about. So give us a brief look at um, what your key points are that could help us. Absolutely. You know, I one of the things that resonates in my book is the idea of communication and building communication, very transparent, honest, most of the time vulnerable communication with your children and your students, letting them know that you are sharing in the same emotions that they are going through, you know working from home, us being at home during the day is making me feel very anxious. I miss my friends from work. How are you feeling about not seeing your friends at school? Um, and then from there, building out opportunities where students can formulate connections. You know, I recommend that if you can set up a time for your student to meet their teacher, either at a distanced um, location uh, ahead of school or on a Zoom call before school starts, just to reduce some of that anxiety, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to make it seem a little bit more familiar, I think that you're gonna get off to a great start. All right, Meredith Esselot, Principal at Mission Dolores Academy in San Francisco, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. We'll take a short break on the air and then be right back. All right, oh, uh, are you still there, Meredith? I am. Oh, excellent. Okay, we can chat for a couple more minutes before we wrap things up for today. Let's see if we have any questions out there. Um, all right, you know what? I am seeing a lot of comments about online not being ideal for younger students. What about those parents who work? I'm sure that is uh, some of the parents in your community. What kind of questions do they have for you about how to make this work? You know, I mean, it, listen, we... I have to say as an educator, I am so grateful for the teamwork that my parents during the spring brought to the table and I know that my colleagues feel the same way. We know that it's not ideal. We never wanted to have to task parents with homeschooling. Um, you know, I'm trying to be as an administrator as flexible and um, as adaptive as I possibly can. If our family needs access to Wi-Fi, we're, we're finding it. If they need access to a vice, device, we're finding it. And if they need strategies or alternative times for their students to oftentimes meet with their teachers, yeah. we're providing it. I think this is a time to be malleable. Okay. Um, and are you guys also helping parents who feel like they need to connect with other parents or kids to set up maybe, um, you know, pods or, or I guess study groups. Are you guys assisting with that? Yeah, you know, we've been looking into um, opportunities throughout the, the city as well mm -hmm. as into the South Bay and to the East Bay as well. So um, that's a that's a process that's in progress, mm. um, but we obviously want to find ways. We're recommending for our families, if there are parents who maybe are out of work currently, that they could uh, assume the responsibility of taking a couple of other students in and making their home environment mm -hmm. a school environment. We're going to try and get creative. We, we want to help our families as much as we can. All right. We have like 15 seconds, but Dorothy wants to know, how do you have kids open to a new teacher on Zoom? 10 seconds. <laughs> You know what? You have to set up that individualized meeting first and foremost, a FaceTime call, um, a way for them to see their face and see that they've got energy and enthusiasm. All right, that's it. You did it. Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much for joining us today on this interactive show, Getting Answers. We'll be here every weekday at 3 on air and online streaming your questions or answering your questions. This week, of course, our focus is on education. So join me tomorrow when we'll have State Superintendent of Schools, Tony Thurman, with us. World News Tonight is next. All right, Facebook friends, thank you so much for joining us today. See you here tomorrow for Tony Thurman. So get your questions ready.